Welcome everybody to our fellowship here at the Tron Church. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles. For we know that the tent that is our earthly home, when it is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, an eternal home in the heavens. We're gathered uh, today to give thanks for the life of Nori Miller, a dear Christian brother and a beloved elder who served in this church fellowship here for over 60 years. Nori slipped away uh, the week before last. It was a blessed release from the frustrations of his declining health uh, from a long stay in hospital. He was tired and he was ready to meet his God because he knew that God for many years as his Lord and Savior through Jesus Christ. Nori Miller could say wholeheartedly these words of the psalmist that are on the fronts of our sheets here. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. So today, although there is sadness, of course, we give thanks to God for his faithful Christian life, for his ministry. Wherever Nori Miller was, which was built from earliest days on our Lord Jesus Christ. So let us worship God together as we sing Nori's favorite hymn. It's about the King of love, who is our only shepherd in life and through death to that true home that he speaks of. The King of love, my shepherd is.
join our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, eternal God, who loves us with an everlasting love and whose goodness never, ever does fail us, we come before you, Lord, in the sweetness of your presence, so tender and kind. And we offer you the worship, the love of our hearts. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's in your presence, Lord, that even the very darkest of shadows flee away. The light of life breaks in upon us and brings us great assurance, great peace. The things that only you can bestow upon us, especially in times of grief. And so we ask, Lord, will you, as we give thanks for the life of our dear brother, will you make the hope of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ shine so brightly for us? And we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now we're going to hear a, a tribute to Norrie from his family, which is going to be delivered by uh, his son-in-law, Dougie Hamilton. Dougie. Thank you, Willie. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of Norrie's family, uh, can I thank you all for taking the time to remember his life today as we gather together. And again, on behalf of the family, can I also say a huge thank you to everyone for your words, your cards, and your flowers which have come our way over the past few days. They are uh, a testament to the care from this church family and from others who held Nori in such high regard. For those of you I haven't met, or at least I haven't met for a while, I am Dougie, Nori's son-in-law, and indeed for a long time in this church at least, that was practically all I was, Norrie Miller's son-in-law. <laughs> and that was a joke that he enjoyed greatly at my expense. Being asked to say something about his life, it's fitting and right that we start with some verses from the book of Philippians in the Bible, because these mark him out in so many ways. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 to 4 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. For here indeed was a life that was not marked by selfishness, ambition, or conceit, but rather by love for others and a dedication to Jesus Christ. It was a life that started 88 years ago in Shettleston, a few miles east of here, when Norrie was born to William and Alice Miller. He was a younger brother to Stan, who had been born a few years earlier. Norrie's childhood years were spent there, where he attended East Bank primary and secondary schools. And he would admit himself that he was never destined to pursue a career in academia. But he did sufficiently well at school to start training as a chiropodist when he left. And that medical training stood him in good stead when he was called up for national service, where he was enrolled in the Royal Army Medical Corps. And eventually, it helped him into a longer term career as a medical representative, primarily with the Bayer Company, for whom he worked for a number of years before retiring in 1999. Speaking to former colleagues earlier this week, they spoke of how universally liked and admired Norrie was, whether with his buyer colleagues or with the doctors and pharmacists he interacted with. As you might have seen from some of the photographs, in his younger days, he was quite the sportsman. He excelled at football, cricket, athletics, and golf. And he maintained that love of sport into his later years, although, of course, eventually, it was in watching rather than participating. He was always ready to offer an opinion on Rangers' latest team lineup. 
brimming with pithy ideas on how they could play in a more cavalier style. Norrie's school days also led to the forming of long-term friendships with others. And most significantly, it led to his relationship with Joyce, which started when they were both in early secondary school. They were married after Norrie's national service in 1959. Yesterday would have been their 64th wedding anniversary, a testament to the commitment and faithfulness of their marriage. Audrey, Lorna and Elaine arrived over the years afterwards. Having three daughters meant that Norrie was always outgunned in the house when it came to family conversations. I sympathised with him on several occasions whenever he was asked a question. He would start to draw breath to respond, during which time he'd be asked another three questions. But he wouldn't have had it any other way. He was a devoted husband, a caring and committed dad to his daughters, and also to Darren, Lane's husband, and me, a doting papa to his grandchildren, Scott, Claire, Callum, Juliet, Sophia, and Francesca, and latterly, a papa as well to his great-granddaughter, Lois. Sharing our stories with each other over the last few days, we remember him as a dad who was ever there when needed and for whom nothing was too much trouble, a papa who was always fun to be with, and above all, someone whose genuine care for his family was evident in his interactions with them. But however important family was to Nori, his overriding priority and his commitment was to serve Jesus. Joyce recalls he spoke to her about this on their first ever date, urging her to commit herself to the same path. It was a path that both Nori and Stan pursued following their upbringing in a Christian home, and Nori never wavered from it. Nori and Joyce started to attend the Tron Church around the time of the Billy Graham Crusade in Glasgow in 1955. In these days, we were located in our old building in Buchanan Street, and the church had just started to move under the direction of Tom Allen, who was minister at the time and who was heavily involved in setting up the crusade. Norrie served at the Tron through five ministries and, as Willie said, for decades as an elder here, an under-shepherd of God's people. His compassion and his care for others marked him out in that role. He was a true people person, if ever there was one. Many of us here today carry fond memories of our interactions with him as an elder and as one who went out of his way to make people feel truly welcome. Only God knows how many people he greeted at the church door in Buchanan Street and then again here in Bath Street with genuine words, a warm smile and of course a firm handshake. Or again, how many people did he speak to during our times here together before and after our services? His smile was in many ways his hallmark, indicative of his warmth and generosity of spirit. And wherever Norrie was serving, Joyce was alongside him. At the front door, welcoming people in the building, seeking out visitors to make sure they felt welcome, taking a genuine interest in their lives and well-being. Like all of us, he had his flaws, and as a family, we saw them at first hand. But they were usually accompanied by a roguish glint in his eye, and a hint of that smile appearing on his face as he tried, and usually succeeded, to talk his way out of whatever precarious predicament he found himself in. And of course, these flaws are past him now. I want to finish by reading from a letter the family received from Sinclair Ferguson, one of our former ministers, after he heard of Norrie's journey to be with Christ. Sinclair recalled a time when it was a tradition that at communion, the minister would be flanked by our session clerk and the longest serving elder. Sinclair writes as follows. So many treasured memories. Perhaps the one that comes back with special pleasure now is of the first day Norrie took his place at the communion table when he became the senior elder and moved into the seat at my left at the communion service. When I went home after the service, Dorothy, that's Sinclair's wife, said to me, it was wonderful 
to see Nori beside you there today. It was so lovely to see someone who looked so happy to be at the Lord's table. We both love to see Nori smile. Sinclair finishes, until we see him again, we will think often of his welcoming smile and know that he is smiling now because he's at a better table, the supper of the lamb, the savior he loved so much and so well, with a smile more beautiful than ever. Thank you. We've heard uh, in Norrie's life of a hope that stands the test of time, that lifts our eyes beyond the beckoning grave. And we're going to sing of that now in our second hymn. There is a hope that burns within my heart. let's turn to the Word of God that gave Nori such hope in life and such peace uh, in facing death. It's uh, in the center of your uh, orders of service there, Paul's words to the church in Corinth. And what Paul is saying is that because we have sure and certain hope of resurrection in Jesus Christ, we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient. 
But the things that are unseen are eternal. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly body, uh, our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked, For while we're still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us his spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. For whether we're at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Amen. This is the word of God. Friends, it's a great honor for me to lead this service of thanksgiving uh, today for a man of God, for a man whose many years of service bore such testimony to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Nori's ministry here among us uh, as a pastoral elder is deeply appreciated, not only to those who are entrusted to his care over the years, but by all of us who loved him as a friend, as a brother, as a great encourager, indeed as a a true example of a, a Christian gentleman. And over the years, his pastoral care has been appreciated so widely, not only by our own folk, but very often particularly by the families of many students and young folk uh, who came to the church here and to whom uh, Nori and Joyce opened their home together and mothered and fathered. And that was such a wonderful witness to the love and the care of a real Christian fellowship, a real Christian family. And for that, we can be rightly proud. We can be very grateful. Nori was a great example, in fact, of what we've been reading recently together as a church in Paul's letter to Titus, an example of an older man, quote, sound in faith, in love, in steadfastness. He was devoted to living out and to sharing true Christian life with his family, with his church, and indeed with uh, the wider community. Nori's diligence was always something uh, that you could rely on. Nori was always on the case. Uh, As soon as he'd heard about a particular need, he'd be on the phone following it up. His thoughtfulness, his kindness, uh, and the faithfulness with which he looked after people, that was something that was evident uh, to everybody here. His cheerfulness was such a mark, wasn't it, of Nori's uh, presence, even even through the more difficult times recently when his health was uh, deteriorating and becoming uh, limiting to him. And of course, the enthusiasm, as has been mentioned already, the enthusiasm of his welcome with Joyce at the church doors was legendary. There are not a few members of our church here today for whom the reason they came back after their first visit was largely because of the welcome that they received uh, from Nori and from Joyce at the door. And I want to testify also that to his pastor, Nori was a great and a constant encourager. Over the years, I've accumulated dozens of emails, of cards, of letters, and phone calls from Nori. And every single one of them contained a word of appreciation, a word of encouragement. Even a recent one, which was about the dose of his diuretic. And Joyce, as you know, that became a, a common topic between us, didn't it, in recent years. But this is how it ended. Joyce and I continue to pray on for you and for the church. And I could go on and on. 
telling of many, many more ways in which Norrie so endeared himself to us as a church family. But even, even in the little I've said, and from what you've heard from Dougie, it's surely evident to everybody that Norrie's ministry was one of depth, it was one of quality, it was one of character, and it was one of real fruitfulness. In fact, only the great last day will finally reveal the true extent uh, of the fruitfulness of that ministry and how honoring, how glorifying his life was to our Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, Nori's service is now over. Or is it? Is it over? Well, no, it's not over, at least not for Nori. That's surely the message of these words we've just read together from 2 Corinthians. Look at them. Paul speaks, doesn't he, of a contrast not between a solid bodily life now and a sort of ephemeral, wispy, spiritual life to come. No, he speaks about the fleeting, transitory nature of our earthly life now and the much more solid reality of the life that is to come. Look at verse 4. While in this tent, that is this earthly body, we groan, he says, and we long not to be unclothed, but to be further clothed. So that what is merely mortal will be swallowed up, not by death, but by life. Verse 5, look, it's for this very thing, he says, this lasting solidity of eternal life and eternal service. It's for this that God has prepared us. And given us his spirit, he says, as a guarantee. And that's why he says in verse 8 that we're of good courage. That's why he says we'd rather be away from this body, this burdened body, this half-clothed, half-naked mortal body, and be at home instead, truly at home with the Lord, properly clothed. He means clothed in real flesh and blood, but flesh and blood that will never fail and never fade. However much Nori loved and, and found great fulfillment in his ministry among us here in the body, what Paul is telling us here is that the complete fulfillment of that ministry is still to come. When the Lord Jesus comes. And when Paul says, each one will receive what is done in the body. Paul's not saying there, of course, that, that we are justified or, or we're saved by what we've done. Of course not. Constantly telling us that we're saved only by God's grace. We're saved in Christ alone. But what he is saying is that those who are Christ's people through faith, that they're being called for an eternal purpose of pleasing service to God, not a temporary thing. And he says we're being prepared for that future now. In the sense that, well, as someone has said, our capacity for future glory is being enlarged, or not, by the obedience with which we respond to the summons of the gospel. To live unto God increases our stature, not only here, but hereafter. Whereas to live unto self makes us shrink and will in the end render us incapable of receiving glory. And that's why Paul says there, you see in verse 9, so whether we're at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And that's why our brother Norrie's life was lived to the last with that aim of pleasing the Lord. See, he pastored, he witnessed constantly as one who knew that he would give an account to the Lord Jesus one day of his stewardship. And we know that, that the humble and gracious living unto God, which so increased his stature in our eyes now, that that also has, has shaped the stature and the service of an inheritance that is 
imperishable and undefiled and unfading and kept in heaven until the day of Christ's appearing. And friends, because we know that, even in this place of mourning, even faced with a reminder, as we're always faced at funerals, aren't we? A reminder of our own frail humanity, our own frail flesh. That's why, even in the face of our mortality, we do not lose heart. We do not lose heart. Though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen. The things that are seen are transient. The things unseen, they are eternal. See, as that verse below that lovely picture of Nori reminds us, we who believe in Jesus, we are a people who can face death with a steady eye because God has made known to us the path of true life. And we know that in his presence is fullness of joy. We know that it's at his right hand that there truly are pleasures, not just transiently, but forevermore. In this hope, we are saved, and in this great gospel, we are comforted. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we give you thanks with proud hearts, with grateful hearts, for our dearly beloved Nori. And having prepared for him a place through your saving death on the cross, we thank you that you've come to take him to be with you where you are, that you've come to take him truly home. But Lord, for all that he was to family, as a loving husband, as a father, as a grandfather, great-grandfather, and to the church family as a friend, as, as a pastor to so many, we give you thanks, we give you praise. And we bless you, Lord, for every happiness, every enrichment that he brought to so many lives in so many ways. And so amid our tears today, we do rejoice. We rejoice in all that he was enabled to be throughout his life, even in these more recent months of frailty and weakness. And we thank you, Lord, for every remembrance of him today. And we pray now, Lord, especially for Joyce, with whom he shared so many years of faithful marriage. In more recent times, who cared so tenderly for him all through his declining health. We thank you, Lord, for the lifetime that they had together. And we ask now that you will grant Joyce all the comfort, all the care she needs both in the nearness of your presence with her and in the care of your people around her. And we pray for Audrey and Lorna and Elaine, the daughters that Nori so loved and, and who so loved their dad and will so miss him. And for all their families who've lost a beloved granddad, a papa. Will you stretch out your loving arms of comfort to embrace them all? And indeed, Lord, all of us who will miss Nori so greatly, not least in this church family here, where he was such a friend, such a father to so many. Shine upon us all, Lord, the light of our Savior, the great comforter, the wonderful counselor, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Shine his light upon us, Lord, so that although we are conscious of our own great weakness, we may indeed rest on thee as our true shield and defender. And in thy name, go on in faith and trust, strong in your strength and safe in your keeping tender. And we ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We close.
close our service by singing together the final hymn on the sheet, We Trust in You, Our Shield and Our Defender. peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Do be seated. And uh, Families ask me to warmly invite you downstairs where there's uh, refreshments and an opportunity for you to meet and greet one another and also uh, meet with them.